Okay, how are we going to begin? Um, so just a little bit of a recap. Over the last couple of weeks, you know, we talked about, of course, from the apostolic age, pre-Constantine era, in Christianity from, you know, the time of Christ, the apostles started out, you know, obviously a small movement, just a few thousand folks was largely resisted in, uh, you know, by both Jewish and Roman society at the time. Still took root and grew, got pretty sizable uh, throughout you know, the second, third century, uh, met with number, you know, quite a bit of resistance, both just social resistance and sometimes state-sponsored persecutions and so on. Post-Constantine, the pre-Constantine uh, era of Christianity, we saw, a, you know, a rise in, uh, not only was it tolerated, but it was actually embraced by the Roman Empire, became the official uh, religion of the, the Roman Empire, and then pretty much became intertwined with the state. And Christianity in the state was, was uh, at least in the Roman Empire, which was, of course, at that time, the dominant empire in the world was was heavily intertwined. Of course, it didn't start out that way. It started out as just a purely spiritual, uh, you know, Christianity as we understand it, for several centuries prior to that. Uh, when they post-Constantine and the intertwining the church of state, obviously, that's had a big impact on the role of church. Now the church had... You know, going from being persecuted and more or less um, operating where it could, right, in the face of social resistance, persecution, now it became a dominant force just in social uh, and political society. Uh, so obviously, quite a big, big change. Um, and there was different centers of Christianity. You had the, the you know, the Pentarchy, as we discussed, uh, Alexandria, Const uh, Constantinople, Rome. Antioch um, or Damascus and Jerusalem. So it was it it, it it started it had started to shape up to become a um is at this period of time we're in the middle ages, it's uh becoming a, a pretty powerful force in the world again, married with the with the state, the, the Roman Empire at this point. Then uh a number of things happened. We say the Rome often, if you're in the West, we'll say the Roman Empire fell in 476. Extra, actually, it's the Western Roman Empire. So Rome uh, in the West, of course, had, you know, with the, with the um, capital and the city of Rome, that fell. In the East, it continued on for another, for, you know, I don't know, I guess a thousand years roughly, all the way up until the, I think, the 1400s when Constantinople fell. But there was the basis of, uh, the East, what we, uh, Byzantium, or the, the Eastern Roman Empire, they just referred themselves as Romans. But the Greek-speaking uh, Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire continued on, uh, whereas Rome fell, and then they had to push back, and it sort of Western, uh, the Western Roman Empire in Europe was sort of a bit in disarray for the following centuries. Um, this actually created a power, a bit of power vacuum. Since there is no more Western Roman emperor, the church is very influential. Uh, now the Pope can fill in and take this role. So now when there's disputes, and when there's issues, when somebody wants to rise up and take power in one of the various Western European lands, this puts the Pope in a kingmaker situation because if you have the blessing of the Pope, uh, that it's hard to resist that to say this person has been anointed by Pope as king of this region and this land. Uh, then this is this this gives quite a bit of secular authority to the to the papacy in the Western Roman Empire. And so we see this kind of uh, culminated in uh, Charlemagne or Charles the Great uh, in the early uh, birth. I think that's yeah, it's not that, that those years. I don't know if he lived at 400 years or not, but during that period, he was uh, crowned emperor of the Romans by Pope Leo III on Christmas Day. So, you know, it, it says that uh, it, now the Pope crowns Charlemagne in this region, right? <clears throat> in this period, in, uh, in again, Charlem Charlemagne is now coronated, and he he sort of positions himself as as the you know a bringing back of of the Roman Empire, the reunification of of the Roman Empire. But of course he's just the Frankish Empire in in the uh in the West, not uniting the East. So I want to show this map. This map may be a bit hard to read, but I think it, 
in, in the, during this period in the 800s, it kind of captures what's going on. So if you see this purple uh, in the, uh, you know, above Italy in, uh, you know, modern day Central and Western Europe, this is the Frankish Empire, which is under Charlemagne at this period of time. You can see this yellow period, this yellow region here. This is the Byzantine or the Eastern Roman Empire. And then in the uh, the orange, uh, this is the uh, basically the Islamic Caliphate. <clears throat> so the, this region here is, is Christian. You have the Latin speaking uh, Roman Church in the in the West, with Latin rites and masses are in Latin and Latin you know, languages. Whereas in the East, of course, it's um, it's Greek speaking language and different cultures, different customs, but both still Christian. Uh, with different different leadership in the various major cities, and then of course you have the uh, massive expansion of the um, of the Islamic uh, empire in North Africa and Middle East. They actually, if you can see, they actually pushed fairly far up into Spain. Well, a significant piece of Spain was conquered by by Islamic rule for a period of time. Ultimately. Uh, Christian waves kind of pushed it back out, but this is, you know, under, underneath uh, the uh, the Roman, or this was the world as Charlemagne took power. So you have all this, these kind of dynamic shaping up. You have uh, Christians in Eastern, Western Europe, although they are a bit sp split by their leadership already. Uh, and again, just Culturally, there's already a pretty big difference between the Latins in the West and the Greek speaking in the East. Uh, so th this was kind of the lay of the land. Uh, and, and again, it's it's hard to really talk about Christianity in this in this period, absent what was going on just in the, in the world at the time, because again, Christianity and the state were merged completely at this point. There was no this is, you know, the, the the separation of church and state as we understand it wasn't around during this period <laughs> that had been gone after Constantine. And then also uh, this the Islamic region, uh, that was also, you know, again, that was religion and state as, as kind of one from the beginning. So this was, uh, as things were shaping up, the, the church, the Christian church was still united at this period. Uh, you still had the Pope in the West, there was other patriarchs, patriarch of Constantinople, uh, patriarch of uh, Alexandria, and so on. Uh, they were still in communion, still in full communion with each other. But were, uh, th were those pockets of the the Islam Caliphate mm -hmm. in in Europe, Estonia, and those? Uh... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, like I said, they, uh, they, and of course they begin to push. This is in the 800s, right? Uh, and obviously they push up into, you can even see the Omeyyad, Emirate, uh, Cordova. So they, they come into Spain here. Uh, and then they also begin to push west. I mean, obviously now, of course, uh, this is what modern day Turkey, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but you know, uh, uh, south of the Black Sea there, of course, they, they pushed in in, in uh, take over um, Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, and they take over Constantinople, which is uh, now Istanbul. So this was as it was a hundred, but you're right. I mean, they 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 continue to to sort of push into what was Christian territory, uh, pushing in in westward into Asia Minor. Now Turkey, which is Islamic, and then they did push pretty far as you see here most of spain uh but then that that was that was this you know kind of back and forth and then they ultimately christianity now spain is of course mostly a catholic country but this was going on at the time <clears throat> okay thank you so ultimately this is leading up to the east-west schism and what happened during this period is that ultimately east and west they no longer were no longer in communion, and you see that to this day. Uh, it being about Eastern Orthodox churches and Catholics, uh, they're split. Right there's there's a schism, and they're no longer in full communion. And a lot of things led up to it. Uh, they there are some legitimate 
theological issues they don't agree on as a couple of them. Uh, one is, I mean, there's more than a couple, but there's a couple of major ones. Uh, one is is the uh, in the in the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, uh, Eastern Orthodox use just leavened bread. It just looks like a loaf of bread, basically. It's bread that's got uh, leavening in it, so it's ris rises. Catholics use unleavened bread in the Eucharist, so this is something they disagree about. I didn't list it here, but there's also uh, in the Nicene Creed, which lists how they view Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the, in the West, they added a clause called the filioque way, which means and the Son. They say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the Eastern always say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. So they dispute on this. So there was some legitimate theological issues that they, the Eastern churches and the Western churches over the years, the different cultures, they incorporated different practices and different views on things. Uh, although they didn't split really over that. I mean, those are things that would make it harder maybe for the United today. Ultimately, it was a cultural divide between the Eastern churches uh, and Western that formed before the schism. And again, it's, it, they're people, right? So Eastern Empire spoke Greek and had distinct Greek uh, Byzantine culture. Western church spoke Latin, had a Roman-based culture. So over the centuries, you have diff people speaking different language groups, uh, different cultures. So they just didn't see eye to eye on a number of things. Uh, and ultimately, it was a power struggle, right? I mean, uh, the Pope is gaining quite a bit of political power in the West. <clears throat> uh, and he's claiming, it, he begins to claim universal ju uh, jurisdiction. He says, I'm the first over all of the uh, patriarchs. All right, I'm over all the other different uh, sees, as they call them, the other different jurisdictions of Christianity, he says it all rolls up, you know, to the to the church in Rome. Uh, the other leaders throughout the church obviously uh, didn't really agree with this. Uh, ultimately, there's some other political factions that have, or there's some other issues that that happen. Uh, the Eastern Church is unhappy with the West as they see a lack of unification and support as. They have on their borders the marching of the uh, of the Islamic expansion, and they're I think they get a bit frustrated with the West about you know not what they view as not sufficient support in the face of that. Uh, ultimately, 10, uh, 1054 uh, AD, they uh, there's a schism, which means there's a split. And uh, the first step in this process was led to form uh, the formal schism. The Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, who was Michael uh, Cerularius, ordered the closure of all Latin churches in Constantinople. So we're having these growing disputes. So there are some Latin-speaking churches in Constantinople. Uh, so there were some Greek churches in southern Italy that had been forced to conform to Latin practices. So he responds by closing. <laughs> uh, and so anyway, the closing of the Latin churches was basically, this was this was kind of the straw that broke the, the candles back here. So they say, all right, we have some Latin speaking churches from the Latin folks in our regions. And they start closing those and vice versa. The Greek speaking churches in the, in the Western regions, they get closed in the face of some of these disputes. And then finally, they just, they just formally split in 1054 AD. And so that's a thousand years ago, roughly. And it is the Eastern Orthodox churches roman catholic churches they're still they're still not united <clears throat> going back to these centuries old disputes so this is kind of an interesting uh thing it's not, i mean obviously we're, we're building up to the reformation here uh but again we have in this period of time we see uh disputes so some of them were theological but mostly over a political power struggle and of course, in the Reformation, there's a lot more significant, um, you know, theological disputes, let's say. But, you know, this, this, the element of the power struggle is ever present, right? It's, it's usually when churches split or go their own ways, uh, it's usually both of these things are at play, right? It's both a, we disagree on something we feel is important as well as uh yeah 
power struggles. People, you know, feel that they should have the say or the control on this. And there's somebody else who feels that they have the authority to do it. And so that this is typically some combination of these things led to the split. And this was one of the first major splits in Christianity. Again, this is a full, you know, four to 500 years before the Reformation. So we see this, uh, this split taking place. <clears throat> um, and then some of the, some of the, dis some of the um, disputes from this uh, and the disagreements from this, you know, they ultimately tie into coming up with, uh, you know, the, 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 in the uh, Reformation to come. Um, and of course, you know, the crusades that follow this um, with, with the Western church moving into the, uh, into the Holy Land, that also leads to some of the, uh, uh, some of the ground leading up to the Reformation. So I want to talk uh, throughout this class, I don't want to talk merely about what happens, you know, on the on the state and the politics and what's going on in the church and the world at the time, because again, there's throughout the story of the church, as I mentioned, you know, uh, in previous classes, this is what's happening at a high level. Right. This is what's happening at you know big picture level with the with the leaders of the church. At this point in history, of the church also have significant political authority. Uh, but I don't want to paint the the picture that this is all that's going on in the church. Right. So just as in your own churches where you attend, the leaders may do certain things, but the the leaders are not all of Christianity, right? There's also many, many men and women doing small things every day, doing all sorts of things that have a positive impact on each other, positive impact on the world around them. And that's been true throughout uh, throughout Christianity. So when you talk about, you know, a big picture, okay, so the East and West, you had a power struggle, Pope began growing power, they had some disputes, there was a schism, they split, uh, then we'll talk, you know, later on about the Crusades. Okay, so yeah, that is true. That is what's going on, you know, church leadership, high level, the church. But there's, you know, many, many countless men and women doing many good things. Uh, and I think it's it's every bit as important to consider those and to think about those uh, in context. So I just wanted to go through and list some of those things. Um you know, and again, the incarnation, that's that's the word of God, the son of God becoming man. Um, this had a really profound effect on, on mankind. Uh, the knowledge of the incarnation and teachings of Christ led to profound changes in a number of areas. Uh, charitable behavior, believe it or not, academic scholarship, uh, and it transformed the lives of countless individuals. So I want to talk a little bit about, about these positive impacts uh in in christian you know the impact that christianity had that's not as often discussed or recorded one of them you may or may not know is is the development and proliferation of hospitals uh so hospitals as we know them are basically uh, a product of of uh, christian theology christian beliefs and so on so after the first council of nicaea uh, of construction of a hospital uh, in every cathedral town was begun. And among the earliest of those was the physician in Constantinople, uh, which is, uh, you know, and this was the most famous was the one called uh, the Basiliad. And it took on dimensions of the city with streets, buildings for different classes of patients, dwellings for physicians and nurses, workshop and industrial schools contained, you know, hospital, poorhouse, hospice care, and so on. So this was, I mean, this is, you know, 1,600, 1,700 years ago. So organized hospitals were not a thing uh, before this. <clears throat> Inpatient medical care in the sense of what we today consider a hospital was an invention driven by Christian mercy, starting with the Byzantines, which is the Eastern Roman Christians, in the 4th century AD, so the 380s. Some hospitals maintained libraries and training programs. Doctors compiled their medical or pharmacological studies and manuscripts. Byzantine hospital staff included chief physician, professional nurses, and orderlies. Uh, and by the 12th century, Constantinople, 
which was the capital, you know, Eastern, uh, the Eastern Roman Church. Constantinople had two well-organized hospitals staffed by doctors, both male and female. Uh, facilities included systematic uh, treatment procedures and specialized wards for various diseases. So, again, this uh, inpatient medical care in the sense of what we today is, you know, it's in the sense of what we today consider hospital was an invention driven by Christian mercy. So that's really the, the key point here is, you know, you know, countless men and women driven by their beliefs in mercy, in charity, um, was what drove them to create hospitals and medical care. And you see this even reflected today. I mean, how many hospitals have um some christian name or denomination attached to you know like houston methodist or you know saint john's and there's various different made the major denominations often have you know hospitals you know there's often religious names tied to many number of hospitals and christian churches have always been major donors uh, and supporters of hospitals and, and in fact they actually developed them there was no concept of hospitals before. They may have medical healers and things, but uh, this this structure, uh, complete structure of a hospital, was a, a, was invented by Christians, you know, in the fourth century A.D. So this is, I mean, just think of the impact that this has had on the world. I mean, you can't. It's hard for us to even to imagine a world without hospitals, without medical care. And of course, as time goes on, modern medicine is shaped by many, many things. But this, this, this uh, overall concept and approach to medicine was something that developed in Christianity, um, and it, it developed largely because <clears throat> because of the mindset, right? Because of the ethical codes and principles. Uh, again, the concept of mercy and charity was fundamental to Christianity. So that's what drove them to start these things in the first place. So it wasn't exploring the cutting edge of medical science. It was purely like, hey, we should do something to help people in certain states. Uh, and so this is this is what uh, you know drove that. And this is from Albert Johnson, who's a uh, historian of medicine. It says, during these centuries, 4th to the 14th, uh, the Christian faith permeated all aspects of life in the West. The very conception of medicine, as well as its practice, was deeply touched by the doctrine and discipline of the church. This theological and ecclesiastical influence manifestly shaped the ethics of medicine, but it even indirectly affected its science, since, as its missionaries evangelized the peoples of Western and Northern Europe, the church found itself in a constant battle against the use of magic and superstition in the work of healing. It championed rational medicine along with prayer to counter superstition. So again, it's for us today looking at it and saying, "Ah, oh, okay, well, yeah, you know, we're so used to having modern medicine hospitals. This just seems like a, a, a kind of a cornerstone even of society. But, you know, you have to look back when these things were started. Uh, people's views on illnesses, uh, you know, people's views on um, what to do with the sick, even. There was even some views that, you know, um, misfortune, you know, illnesses may have been your fault or something you did, something one of your family members did, uh, you know, so, and then what to do, right? I mean, when somebody got sick, was this, there was a lot of superstition tied to it. So it was Christianity yeah, in, in you know this in this era in this period, they created care. You had mercy on somebody if they got sick, regardless of the reasons why, right? You need mercy for the sick. We need to take care of the sick. Um, and let's try to find how that we can help these people. And they pushed it's uh even superstition on some of the superstitious reasons why somebody may may get sick. Uh and some of the superstitious beliefs and then methods of healing. A lot of that was driven out by Christian views on mercy and even, you know, the the theology, which, you know, again, discarded um, superstition. So it had a really powerful effect that's still seen even to this day. And now these beliefs are more or less seeped into um, even secular society. Uh, but it wasn't always that way, right? And it was the Christian uh, the Christian worldview, which 
which made this view, uh, this this perspective on an approach on how to treat the sick and how they should be interacting with and cared for. It was the Christian worldview that established that within society. This is some of the characters I like to just talk a little bit about. If you may have not heard of them, they're, they kind of shape the world, but they don't get as much um, discussion. John Philoponus is the one that before 95, 78 uh, AD. Uh, he was he was uh, well ahead of his time, even before Galileo and these guys. Uh, he was he would challenge Aristotle. Came up with the idea that uh, you know matter in the heavens and the stars was the same as that uh, as on Earth, which you know, that was an idea from the ancient Greeks that really didn't get challenged after Philoponus was didn't get challenged again until the scientific revolution. But uh, he was really influential in this period of time, had a Christian worldview. He actually argued, do I have him on the next slide? Yeah. He actually argued that the world uh, had a, the universe had a beginning, right? And he, he thought this because of his Christian viewpoint. The scientific views at the time was that the universe was eternal, that the heavens always existed. There existed an infinite amount of time. They just always have been. Uh, and he argued effectively that no, no, they they could not have been. The universe had a start point. Uh, the, the you know the Earth had a start point, and so on. Uh, and he argued against the common views at the time, the scientific view at the time that that went against that. And now, of course, the scientific consensus is that in fact the universe did have a start point. But you know he was making this argument, you know, fifteen hundred years before it was widely accepted. And this again was driven by his his Christian worldview. Look him up on your own time. He's an interesting character. Had a lot of interesting ideas that were many centuries ahead of his time. Another thing that's not often talked about, you know, the, the two massive institutions in in modern um, the modern world, modern society. I mentioned one already: the hospital. The other one is the university, and that was also a product of of um, christianity uh, and, and now it's surprising to some people some people say well yeah there's various academies that existed in ancient china india and greece like plato had an academy there was a, there was academies in china and india outside of before and outside of uh, the, the the christian world and that's true the distinction is that um universities when we talk about a university now the way they were first um set up in the 12th century they did two things they were more than just an academy they weren't just a place of learning but they were they degree they granted degrees and uh they and they conducted research so you know plato's academy you know now again it's one of those things that's so intertwined with modern society you think i've got an associate's degree i've got a bachelor's degree a master's a phd and, and so on law degrees uh you know, but this has not always been the case, right? I mean, you didn't get a bachelor's degree from the Plato's Academy in ancient Greece, uh, and they didn't conduct research. They they had they would talk. There was lectures, there was discussions, and so on. That's true, and they shared information and knowledge, but they were not degree granting institutions where formal research was done, performed, and then published, and so on. So this began the modern degree granting research-based university, which is how all universities and institutions of the type are structured currently. That began around the 1200s, so our 12th century, so 1100s, and it was the product of Christian monasteries. This is from uh, University of Texas site on the origin of universities. It says many historians state that universities and cathedral school schools were a continuation of the interest in learning promoted by monasteries. So you had in the church, you had groups of monasteries where people would come together and study things, learn things. And from this, uh, the, this was the birth of, of universities. And the oldest universities in both Europe and the United States were founded as Christian institutions. Uh, you know, list of here, Oxford, uh, University of Paris, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Princeton, so on. Uh, many were actually established first as seminaries in places where preachers 
uh, ministers of various types would go and get to do theological studies, which is, you know, uh, interesting because, and this uh, stayed that way for many centuries, really, from the 12th century, probably all the way up until the 1800s. It wasn't till really late 1800s, really probably the 1900s, that many universities started to become more secular. And now, you know, a lot of universities see, are seen as very secular places. But that, you know, from 12th century, let's say up until 19th century, that, that certainly was not the case. <clears throat> yeah, a little bit more on that. It says, not only did the modern university begin as a product of Christian institutions, but they remained in the service of the church for many centuries. As I mentioned here, didn't really shift till secular until 19th, really mostly 20th century. Uh, and from Albert Schmidt, he wrote a book. It's interesting if you will look up called How Christianity Changed the World. It says, from their monastic roots and through the 19th century, all universities were founded as Christian institutions, regardless of whether they taught law, theology, or medicine. Until well into the 19th century, even with the growth of scientific studies, Western universities and colleges almost always operated within theological boundaries. <laughs> so now, you know, these the two primary institutions the modern society uh churches and hospitals are actually products of christianity and they operated like that i mean now that may seem a bit surprising but for many many centuries that would have been a very obvious fact and that was a well-known thing in society you would have seen a church or a university as an, ex I'm sorry, you would have seen a hospital or university as simply an extension of the church, which is what they were. And then now, of course, there's, there's secular hospitals, secular universities, but that's not how they started. And that's not how they operated for many, many centuries. Another gentleman mentioned, you can look up on your own, I'll skip a little bit about him, Anselm of Canterbury. Uh, he was known as the founder of scholasticism. Uh, he argued for the existence of God with various logic arguments. He said you could just know about God, even if you didn't have the Bible or teachings, you could know he exists with certain, um, uh, by, by, with certain, you know, logical arguments one could know uh, about God. Um, and he has this quote I found interesting. God often works more by the life of the illiterate seeking the things that are God's than by the ability of the learned seeking the things that are their own. <laughs> There's another thing that happened in uh, in Europe in the 12th and 13th centuries it was known as the charitable revolution, right? So again, even this was this was the period during the crusades when you look back and you look at christianity in this period you know before the middle ages you may see the conflict between the east and west leading to the east and west schism you may see about you know the rise of islam and the conflict with the christian christendom uh and the crusades and all of these things uh but again just just keep that in mind there's all these other things were happening too this is also the charitable revolution across europe <clears throat> The 12th and 13th centuries were hundreds of leper houses and hospitals from the second floor, along with uh, lay co confraternities. That's that's lay just means not the priest class, not the minister class, but the, the you know men and women who were not officially uh, you know hired or uh, hired or you know, directed by the church to do anything. It's just the, the, the members of the church. So organizations dedicated to charity, mutual support, and religious devotion. They set up monasteries, penitential groups doing charitable work. Bishops and monks founded many of the new hospitals and stained them with their funds and labor. But lay people, again, the, the non-clergy, non-priest class, also began shouldering the charitable load. New heights of personal sacrifice were seen in hospital donors and hospital workers. So, it, it, you know, when you have things like many, many hospitals taking care of the sick, this was not for-profit business, right? This was people giving of their time, giving of their money, lay persons, not professionals, not, you know, uh, hired to do so, but they were taking the time to, to contribute with their own personal funds and their time to make these things a reality. And without that, 
right? They really, it's, you couldn't just have a hospital spring up and, you know, just as an idea and take root, right? I mean, these, to make them a reality that they are now when all of these things were, were necessary. And it happened by many, many countless, you know, names, you know, lay persons who are lost in history, but they're the ones who really made these things a reality. And this period represented a turning point in the ways ordinary men, women and men thought about and acted toward their poor and needy neighbors. So again, you know, when you think about, <clears throat> uh, you know, and you read even in the New Testament, the Old Testament about beggars and lepers and the blind, and they're just almost just kind of like a nuisance, you know, before the time of Christ. And even during the time of Christ, uh, you know, how little patience or sympathy anybody had for these people. You know, if you read in the, in the New Testament, the gospel accounts, you know, people were just begging Jesus for mercy, the blind, the sick, the lepers. And how did the people around Jesus view those people? wasn't with patience or sympathy they're like you know don't be bothering jesus with this stuff right <laughs> it's got important stuff to do but who who did take notice of them and take mercy upon them was jesus and provided healing and other acts of mercy uh, for them and so this message right the christian message message of mercy and charity uh okay it took some centuries for it to take through <laughs> I mean, but um, over the centuries, and it's still something even to this day that that's gets lost, or not lost, that gets maybe deliberately overlooked in the message of Christianity. But the idea of mercy for the poor, for the sick, for the less fortunate society, um, you know, the, one of the fundamental uh, fundamental messages of Christianity. But that message has had powerful impact from the time of Christ throughout the entire centuries in between up into present day. So if you read back during this period, you'll read about, certainly you can read about the church getting political power and corruptions and things that did poorly, and not to minimize that or say that that's false, but there was also countless lay persons, you know, not powerful men and women who uh, learn about or who take seriously the teachings of Christ and take mercy uh, upon the less fortunate and do what they can with the small funds they have, uh, you know, to help to help one another. And this was going on, uh, you know, there's the charitable revolution here in the 12th and the 13th centuries. New concern with the plight of the sick and the poor shows up consistently in the testaments or the wills of the period. Among 13th century testaments in Flanders, 85% uh, included charitable requests to aid lepers, hospitals, widows, and the ransoming of captives. 44% included a request to leave at least one hospital. Uh, uh, 40, a request to at least one hospital. Similarly, in East Central France, two thirds of the wills from 1300 included distributions of coin and or food to the poor. Uh, so what this is saying is that and what they can find of wills, last week wills and testaments, is significant percentage. The majority of them, 85% it says here, include charitable requests to lepers, hospitals, widows. So people leaving uh, their things, not merely to their wife, their kids, or so on, but a, a lot of money they're leaving to lepers, widows, and so on. Uh, the hospitals, uh, coin distribution to the, the poor. So there's basically just uh, a realization, you know, to, to care for one another, to care for the less fortunate. And you see that recorded. It's just overwhelming when you read what uh, the, the surviving writings of that period of time, how much people, it was on people's minds during this period of time. And you know how, how many Christians uh, were were that was foremost on their mind with what to do with with the uh, with the things that they did have. Theologians in this period emphasized that the best way to express love to God was to act lovingly towards their neighbor. So again, it wasn't merely that people just got it wasn't an unexplainable 
you know, wave of emotion, a realization that these people suddenly have. It was driven by, you know, the Christian theology, uh, the fundamental, I mean, the, the greatest commitment, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So people during this period of time are taking very seriously uh, the commandment to love, love their neighbor as themselves. Uh, yeah, it was a revolution in feeling that in throne, not just charitable acts, but in compassion and most emotions is vital Christian virtues. Um, the emphasis on Christian emotions began cropping up by the end of the 12th, often focused on Christ's passion. That's, of course, the, the death of Christ. The medieval faithful projected their own deeply felt relations with the suffering Jesus and compassion and Mary onto the poor and sick of their own community. The empathy with Christ that they experienced in their devotions allowed them to see Jesus and the poor sufferer and thus to act compassionately on his or her behalf. So this is uh, this is something that, again, we live in a society that's been so profoundly shaped by Christianity. So we grow up with hospitals, with universities, with now whether we're actually charitable or merciful or not you know we all have our own uh you know walk with that and sometimes maybe in your own life you've maybe not i can speak for myself and say i've not always been as merciful or charitable as i could be that's certainly true but i know it's something i should aspire to be right i don't it's it's not if somebody tells me, you know, you could be more, have more compassion and mercy and all this, mercy. I'm not shocked by that idea. I mean, maybe I'm not doing it to the best of my abilities, but I understand that, uh, I understand that ethic, right? Because we were sort of grown up in a Christian society or a society where Christianity has had such a profound impact. So we understand those basic fundamental ethics. And so it can, we can take them for granted right not not meant in the sense that we don't think that they're true but it just seems like it's an ethic that every society or every community should have but you have to imagine that cultures and regions of the world that weren't touched by this right that didn't have the gospel message and that ethic uh, that this idea is was not did not permeate the world right there's pockets of the world many pockets places even in the world today but certainly you know before the Christian message uh, went throughout much of the known world, you know, this idea that it was fundamentally important to be compassionate on the less fortunate was not necessarily a given. Matter of fact, it, you know, to a large extent, didn't really exist. Um, why? Because a lot of, there was a common view, and it still exists even up to this day in some places, that bad things that happen to a person, whether poverty, whether illness, whether misfortune, is in some way cosmic balance, right? It was something you did in another life, something one of your ancestors did, something you deserved. Uh, so this idea that no, there's just the misfortune you should have compassion on it wasn't it wasn't a universal idea uh, during that period. Yeah, just throughout the world. It was really, Christianity played a fundamental role in establishing the fact that uh, we should have mercy and compassion on the less fortunate. So you may have heard of St. Francis of Assisi. Again, he was during this period of time, you know, up into the charitable revolution, uh, or just prior to it. Uh, Francis was uh, the son of a prosperous silk merchant, so he came from a, um, a wealthy family. Uh, he got he had a serious illness and he had a vision. And then he went on a pilgrimage to Rome. And he actually begged outside of the St. Peter's Basilica with the poor. Uh, he spent a lot of time just by himself asking God for spiritual enlightenment. He also took to nursing lepers. So he would personally tend to and nurse and bandage lepers. He embraced, even though he came from money, he he embraced a life of poverty, refused his father's money and inheritance. And this is a story I love about St. Francis. Uh, this was, you know, during the times of the Crusades. Uh, he didn't like the violence of the Crusades. Uh, he went to see his own religious leaders, begging the cardinal to stop the fighting. 
uh, they didn't listen to him. <laughs> so uh, in 1219, Francis went to Egypt in an attempt to convert the Sultan of Egypt, who was al Kamil, the nephew of Saladin, uh, uh, to try to convince him and convert him to Christianity and put an end to the conflict of the Crusades. So you can imagine the East and the West, or uh, the 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 crusades right christian christian world and the, the islamic world have been fighting i think at this point it was already on the fifth crusade for some time uh and he he walks he tries to convince his own religious leaders uh to stop the fighting they don't he takes a pilgrimage down to egypt and just walks right in as a christian minister directly <laughs> walks up to the the Islamic uh, armies and leaders preaches the gospel to the Sultan and uh, wasn't able to convince him that what's the image is shown on the right is he actually uh, he challenged the Muslim scholars to what's known as a trial by fire. So the legend goes, which he says, I say Christianity is true. You say Islam is true. We'll walk, both walk through the fire and the Lord will decide. <laughs> you know, and uh, they, they didn't take him up on his offer. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, the Sultan granted him mercy, he sent him back to Europe. He didn't He didn't convert. He didn't stop the conflict, but he, he allowed him to, to go back home. So uh, anyway, I thought that was that's a little bit about St. Francis. There's more kind of incredible stories. He ultimately... Uh, got sick and died at a fairly young age. There's different theories as to why. Some people think because he was around lepers so much, he actually caught leprosy himself. I don't know if it's completely clear, but he he died maybe in his 40s. I can't remember exactly the age, but uh, well, you can do the math there 1181 to 1226. So, uh, let's see, next to the Roger Bacon. I want to talk about Roger Bacon. We'll talk a little bit about Elizabeth of Hungary. Um, she was the daughter of King Andrew II uh, and Princess of Kingdom of Hungary. So again, she's royalty, right? Uh, at age 14, she married Louis IV, uh, and he died on his way to the Sixth Crusade. We don't know if he had a health issue or how he died, but he just died on his way. Uh, when she was only 20 years old, uh, and she was really in love with him. It wasn't just a forced marriage. She loved him, and he said, he is dead, he is dead. It is to me as if my whole world died today. After uh, she died, she regained her dowry. That means she got her money back, so she had quite a bit of money. And she used the money to build a hospital where she personally served sick people. So you imagine you're a princess. Back in those days, dowry, it's like they would pay big chunks of money for the unification, so... After the, the, the husband died, she got her dowry back. So this is a lot of money she has. So what she do with this money, the child royalty, she builds a hospital. She doesn't just build it and then go live off in the life of luxury. Uh, she served the sick personally. She personally distributed food to the poor, washed their feet each year on Holy Thursday, made them clothes, uh, and, and founded a, a you know found a hospital in Marburg of Thuringia. So this is what this this lady did. Uh, at the hospital, she performed the most unpleasant, humiliating task, experienced the misery of the poor herself. So, and ultimately, she got sick and died at the age of twenty four. So she would, you know, she was doing bedpans, cleaning up after the sick, doing the dirty work basically. So you can imagine you're a princess, you marry a king, he dies, you get the dowry back, and what do you do with it? Right? Well, if you're Elizabeth of Hungary, you build a hospital, you personally tend to the sick, and it cost her a lot. She ultimately died at the age of 24. And that's a remarkable story, right? And what what could be the only thing to motivate somebody to do something like that? You know? how shocking i mean so when you read about to me these stories when we talk about the history of the church the story of the church uh to me this this is it right it's stories like this what's driving the leaders the political rulers they'll do things right they're they're not they don't always do things for the right reasons they'll make choices for power uh for land 
uh, okay, but th there's more to the church than just what political rulers and leaders do in various, various periods of time. Thomas Aquinas, he was a Dominican priest. Uh, he wrote various, he wrote a lot of things. He wrote arguments for the existence of God. He wrote millions of words a little bit late on time. So you can study about him on his own time. But these are some of the really influential Christians, men and women of Christ and during this period of time. <clears throat> I'll, I'll read this quote because um, I just really think it's, it's a pretty quote. Uh, Suppose a person entering a house were to feel heat on the porch and going further were to feel the heat increasing the more they penetrated within. Doubtless, such a person would believe that there was a fire in the house, even though they did not see the fire that must be causing all this heat. A similar thing will happen to anyone who considers this world in detail. One will observe that all things are arranged according to their degrees of beauty and excellence, and that the nearer they are to God, the more beautiful and better they are. I think it's a great quote. He is known for his synthesis of faith and reason. Basically, he says there's faith, Right, you believe things on faith. You also believe things with reason, with your mind, and these are not at odds. Right, he thought the more faith you have, the more you'll grow in uh, wisdom or intellectual um, pursuits, and vice versa. The more you pursue intellectual things, the more you'll grow in your faith. So he thought these faith and reason were not a conflict, but rather they were, you know, synergistic, as we would say, they complemented one another. Thomas Akempis, and y'all may have heard of him. He wrote a book called uh, The Imitation of Christ. Uh, and I like this quote from him. Uh, At the day of judgment, we shall not be asked what we have read, but what we have done. So this is to say you can study all you want to, but on the day of judgment, it's not about all the knowledge you have in your head. It's about what you've actually done um, for others. And if you seek Jesus in all things, you will uh, uh, surely find him. And then this last one, I think, is just, you know, kind of timeless quote. Be not angry that you cannot make others as you wish them to be, since you cannot make yourself as you wish to be. <laughs> think about that. Uh, all the things I'm not able to do in my own life, but I, I get impatient with people, the, the feelings of other people. This actually, the imitation of Christ, uh, apart from the Bible, has been, I think, translated into more languages than any other. It's been around 500 years. It's still kind of prevalent even to this day. So uh, that's kind of the backdrop of of leading up to the Reformation. In the next few weeks, you know, we're going to talk about the the well the developments leading up to the reformate the reformation and then during the reformation and post-reformation that'll more or less take us out the balance of the class but i think it's kind of important to have some of that backdrop uh to know what's what's leading up to it uh yeah we'll talk i'll talk a little bit more about uh prior to the reformation here stop for a few questions and then we'll finish out developments of the reformation and getting the reformation in the coming weeks um yeah, I already did that one. So this, there's a number of things that really set the stage leading up to, you know, Reformation. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Crusades, obviously. So you had the conflict, schism with East-West, the conflict with the Christian world, uh, the Muslim, uh, Islamic world. There was Crusades, a lot of, a lot of, um, let's say, corruptions that happened along with that. A lot of people didn't like the violence, weren't happy with the way a lot of those things went, indulgences, uh, and so on. Another big thing that doesn't often get talked about uh, is what's now called the Black Death. So the Black Death, um, <clears throat> estimated to have killed 75 to 200 million people in the years uh, 13... 46 through 1353 and in, in some cases entire towns in europe were just completely gone it didn't just affect europe it started in the east uh, affected much of the known world but in europe in particular it was really really hit hit really hard um so this is from the historian philip 
uh, Dow leader says the trend of recent research is pointing to a figure more like 45 to 50 percent of the European population dying during a four year period. In Mediterranean Europe, such as areas such as Italy, the south of France, and Spain, or play grant for about four years consecu consecutively, it was probably closer to 75 to 80 percent of the population. Uh, can you imagine? I mean, think about how bad COVID was for much of the world. COVID, I, I don't you can look up the numbers, but maybe less than one percent of the population. You know, it's I don't even think it was a full percent of the population died from COVID. Imagine half the population gone in three years. And in some areas, it is closer to 75 to 80 percent. Could you imagine it being a region where three out of four people are dead three years later? And the world population did not even get back to pre-plague pre -plague levels, levels until the 17th century. And it would it would spring up again. It'd come back throughout Europe for some 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 period, right? We can imagine how what impact this would have on society if you go through an event like that. <clears throat> uh, I read this quote <clears throat> just to kind of give some perspective of what a person in that period of time how they might have perceived it. Uh, this was Agnolo di Turi. He was in Italy, written in his Chronicles in three forty eight. It said, is it impossible for the human tongue to recount the awful truth? Father abandoned child, wife, husband, one brother, another, or this illness seemed to strike through breath and sight, and so they died. None could be found to bury the dead for money or friendship. Members of a household brought their dead to a ditch as best they could, without priests, without divine offices. In many places in Siena, great pits were dug and piled deep with the multitude of the dead, and they died by the hundreds, both day and night and all were thrown in those ditches and covered them with earth. And as soon as those ditches were filled, more were dug. I, and Enola de Turi, buried my five children with my own hands. And so many died that all believed it was the end of the world. So, yeah, you would think it's the end of the world. You went through this. Um, why is this so important? Okay, in, for the context of the history of the church... Big Black Death caused a massive social and psychological impact to Western society. Uh, since the, the church was not able to save people, and again, in some cases, priests and others abandoned their duties, many Europeans began to question the authority of the church. Some people even saw it as divine punishment, maybe for corruptions, uh, crusades, other corruptions of the church at the time. A lot of people thought two things would have come to mind. One, the church wasn't able to stop it. Two, maybe this is divine retribution. Failure of the church to protect the people and even its own clergy led to a dramatic loss of power and influence. The conclusion was that there must be something wrong with the church itself that warranted punishment. So the church, prior to the Black Death, you know, it was basically as a political institution, as a state institution, was incredibly powerful. You know, the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, the church, uh, the Roman church in particular, also the church in the East, they were literally kingmakers. They could set up kings. Nobody could really challenge the authority, both on matters of truth, matters of theology, you know, matters of state. They were, you know, basically unrivaled, unequaled in authority. Uh, the Black Death strikes a big blow on that. You know, um, yeah, so <clears throat> there was also, and I don't, I thought I mentioned on this slide, but I did it. Um, also, because so many people died, like you did have more established priests that were good and knowledgeable after the Black Death, then you had just basically trying to find any more body to fill some of these old offices. So then you have kind of a loss of basically experience, loss of talent as well. So now you have a lot of people that there's, you know, not the best and brightest, basically, whoever is willing to do the job. So you can imagine how this might, if you're a, a Christian during this period of time, assuming you survive, how this might impact how you view the church during this period of time. So I'll stop there. I've done a lot of talking. I'll see if there's any 
thoughts or questions. Call on people if I have to. <laughs> Uh, let's see, how do I stop sharing? Can I stop sharing? All right. Yeah, let's chat a little bit. I'm talking into the void here, so it'd be good to get some of y'all's thoughts. I, I didn't want to be first, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh... Just being the feedback. That... How back in the hospitals are kind of related. Uh, the high, high foundation of the hospitals are today. And yeah. you can see that how some people think about uh, or is it my mind? And she, her money, her husband. Hospital, June. How the hospital and how the hospitals. Sorry, Stephen. I don't know if it's just me, but I only got a little bit of that. Hear me again? Can yeah, me? yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, so no, it was just interesting how the um, how I can't think of a name right now who received the money from her husband started after he died. Uh, started the hospital and she died at an early age with caring for the one we have the hospital here in um, mm -hmm. uh, Saint Jude. So. How that started with compassion. So I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. Thanks for the comment on that. And I, I think to me, that's, I give a lot of stories of that type and you may, it may seem kind of like, well, okay, how does that lead to the reformation or lead to the schism or lead to the crusades and so on? And I guess that's just my point when really one of the motivations when I wanted to do this class some years ago is that, when you say the story of the church, what, what does that really mean? You know, story of the church, the story, even you could say like a story of a country. You can look at what the government does, right? But the country is a lot more than what the government does. And uh, the church is a lot more than just what church leaders do. And I, I think it's important to tell those stories you know, to be that we're connected to those people. Um, you know, the body that's the body of Christ, it's one body. So we're not more than we're separated by time, but yet we're one body. And uh, you know, I think we can take some some lessons from those folks, hopefully some a bit of inspiration, um and in and, and apply some of those things in our in our own life. They're, it, they're ordinary men and women, but they do they do an extraordinary things because they're motivated by the, the gospel teachings. And you, you uh, mentioned about how the church people today, uh, especially in pastors going out in hospitals uh, where their members or they might contact people or their family. So the how that you know she was in a church playing a role today in that in that type of uh how it was back then so foundation base of how it came all about <laughs> yeah yeah i agree i think ken did you have a looked like you came off mute did you have a point here or question um, yeah, I was just gonna, I mean, even, even in my lifetime, um, 
you know, we had a church uh, when I was younger, uh, uh, a church member who's uh, their family's house burned down. Mm -hmm. And and it was really the church that, you know, the church members that, um, you you know, came together and played a big role and and kind of getting them back on their feet. And, you know, you know, even just the basics right after the fire, I mean, you know, literally burned the place to the ground. They had Mm -hmm. no clothes or anything, you know, so it was really, um, you know, the the church and the church members that kind of came together and, and, Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, help them out. And, and, you know, and even, you know, you know, decades ago, you know, you always hear about, you know, there'd be a, an unwed mother and they'd always, you know, bring, leave the baby on the church steps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I think the church has always been kind of a, uh, you know, place of refuge to, to that extent yeah completely agree that's a good point and it should be right it should remain to be and those stories like that for how many you know just many many thousands of millions of um acts uh, of of you know just christian charity from one to another how, i mean how 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 many of those have shaped in your, our own lives you know we have stories where uh, some family member you know was going through something and how the church responded maybe personally how you were going through something and how the church responded um you know how that shapes your own life and how also of course we need to do that for others you know we need to be the hands and feet um and it's again i i i, I just i find it in, i guess a bit encouraging that that's not a new thing right that's been that way from the time of Christ to today, even in centuries, you can say, oh, the church was making these mistakes here and doing this and that, not to minimize that, but you can always find examples of just, you know, late persons, men and women still being the hands and feet, even, even when there was problems and challenges and corruptions and so on. Uh, I don't care if you had a comment or question. Yes. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to give a devotional for um, a club meeting, and I agreed to, and then I was told it had to be non-sectarian, mm-hmm. and the the rebel part of me said, I, <laughs> let's see what we can do. <laughs> so <laughs> I presented Jesus Christ as an historical figure and quoted mm-hmm. ancient historians, mm-hmm. and then I went through very similar format that you did all Mm -hmm. of the charitable things that have happened because of his life and his teaching Mm -hmm. uh and then ask the question you know is the world a better place because he lived Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so sometimes you can can get around restraints Mm -hmm. (laughs) and still do your teaching but it presents a challenge (laughs) <laughs> well if you have any material on that please send me an email i'd like to i'd like to read what you've uh what you put together on that um uh, how was it received when you presented it by the membership it was very well received by the president it was not <laughs> no <laughs> well <laughs> well you did okay. you, yeah you followed the rules right i mean you <laughs> yes i did so, so good for you that's a cool story and it is it is kind of ironic that that you know some of the the institutions you know harvard and and princeton and and uh institutions that you mentioned you know that were founded you know basically by the church um have now become um you know really non uh denominational yeah. at all you know I agree. It's uh, it's it's kind of it's sad, right? But it's 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 interesting how it's happened and how much of the world sees these institutions at odds, even you know, uh, not even that they're that they're no longer affiliated, but they're almost in a lot of ways in culture presented as against each other. Uh, and I wonder, you know, it's it's it kind of come it's how many people even know that that it was churches who founded universities in the first place and founded 
you know, hospitals and do these things. Um, I mean, people would study it would know, but I'm, probably most people in society either don't think about it or, or generally are unaware of it. Well, I, I can get, I'm, I'm up in the Boston area and I can guarantee that, um, you know, most folks don't know that about Harvard or, you know, some of the schools up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cornell, did you have a question or, or comment? Yeah, he brought up schools and that took me to a whole nother direction because uh, I was thinking about many of the, the Christian universities uh, have given themselves over to the industry of money. Yeah. Uh, to, and for a, uh, sort of moved aside, but still they, they've kept their name, which is ironic. They still keep the name, yeah. but don't function in a different way. But um, when we was talking about, Steve was talking about the ministry of the church and how um, um, just uh, dealing with hospitals and stuff. And I was reminded of the ministry we used to have at a church I used to fellowship in Maryland when I used to mm -hmm. live out there. And our ministry was to go, um, I was in a ministerial staff to go to the senior facilities every day. It was not mm -hmm. just the word, but we would sit with them all day uh, until they were done. Mm -hmm. um, it was really just about spending time with them. A lot of ministries go in and just leave. Um, but it was there to serve them um, mm -hmm. for their capacity, whether they just wanted prayer, whether they just wanted to talk, uh, or just uh, wanted company. So we would just, uh, that was our, our duty to just go there and just try to facilitate that need um, mm -hmm. uh, to be that substitute family for. Um, and I was reminded of that um, by the servitude of the, uh, the lady you was talking about uh, in the ministry. Um, and then uh, when I was just got stumped, stunt, I want to say stumped <laughs> or stuck on the Black Plague. And when we talk about the magnitude of death and, and that we were dealing with, and, and we're a more modern nation, mm -hmm. um, so to speak, and all of the funeral homes that were backed up, and you're talking about uh, 40 to 50 percent of the population that are dying off. Um, in three years, mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine the magnitude of death to see that physical death um, because they don't, they didn't have the capacity like we have the capacity with machinery equipment to deal with stuff. Um, how bodies would have just been there? Yeah, you know, that affected people's faith just dealing with that every day. Um, that just, that just got me stumped and lost and thought on that. Um, just to have to face that death every day and, and in line of your faith. So. Yeah, no kidding. That's a good comment. I mean, to me, I just think about that period, you know, man, I don't even know how you get through something like that. You know, again, I think about COVID and how that had such an impact on society. Maybe one, I got, I'm not trying to challenge the numbers. I just don't have them handy, but I think it was less than 1% of the population. Um, and, um, you know, half of that, you know, and like you said, they don't have, they didn't have the, the facilities to deal with it. Our facilities were almost over in, you know, or they were in some cases with what we were dealing with, with COVID. So how, how does that shape your, your, your view on things? How does that rock your faith? Again, I think I'm, Probably they thought it was just the end of the world, the end of all things, you know. Um, but it's interesting. I think we saw even in the time of, of COVID or just in any times of difficulty, you know, it has odd effects. And sometimes it, you know, difficult times, you know, brings people to faith uh, more so. You know, and some people not. Some people it causes a loss of faith, but sometimes difficult times bring people back to faith. Uh, it depends, of course, on on the person. Um, so yeah, that's that's an interesting era. I do think you, you know, Cornell, you made another point on the uh, you know just the the charitable works and the and the, and the acts of service. I think any time you know in Christianity's at its best when it's fixated 
on those those fundamental messages and teachings, right? And I like the little uh, logo for you know the Southeastern Bible Institute. It's you know not to be not to be served but to serve. And Jesus down, you know, with the washing of the feet. And um, if that's the focus, right? Serving your neighbor, the greatest commandment: love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and not not for worldly power, worldly authority, possessions, money, and so on. Uh, that's when obviously Christianity is best. When you see the the missteps, it's just like it's when things are going well and there's positions of power and authority that get set up. You know, a lot of funds. It was good to have a lot of charitable funds, but then it gives creates an opportunity maybe for somebody to misuse those things. That's how, you know, that's how the corruptions and the different things were able to step in. So on the one hand, it's good that Christianity is growing and spreading, but on the other hand, with that opens up, you know, the opportunity at least for for the abuse of those things. So you know, I just think there's the solution is always stay focused on the on the fundamental principles, right? That's what it's the, the fundamental teachings, not to be served, but to serve. Um, you know, stay fixated on that. And uh, you know, easier said than done, but what men and women throughout the history of Christianity have been have been doing their best to do it. So Well, I think we're about at time. Thank you, everybody, for dialing in and for your participation. And I'll get these slides out. I'm sorry I'm delayed on those slides getting out, but I'll get these out and then uh, see each other next week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.